As a young boy, Walt Disney would hear train whistles roar through his small Midwestern town and dream of distant lands. To Walt Disney, trains meant freedom. The trains were a place where he could step on the train and it could take him anywhere in the world. It could take him off to France for World War I, it could take him to Los Angeles, so that was his jet plane. And so trains meant something more than just trains to Walt. He installed one in his backyard in Holmby Hills and had an amazing train outlet in his backyard. And the amazing thing at Disneyland was Walt Disney himself owned the trains and the monorail. So if you worked at Disneyland in the 60s or 70s and you were on the steam locomotive, you got your paycheck from Walt Disney, not from the Disney company. But that's how important trains were to Walt and why Disneyland was such a huge expression of that love of independence of trains. That's why a train circles all the Disney parks. came to Los Angeles during the Roaring Twenties, a time of energy and optimism. Eager to make his mark, he created the animated character Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Oswald had real personality. Here was a rabbit audiences could root for. He was Walt's first big hit and his first crushing disappointment when his business partner stole the rights. Walt feared his career was over. Then, on a long train trip from New York to Los Angeles, inspiration struck. He loved the idea of the mouse, uh, and he thought, Mortimer Mouse, it's going to be fantastic. Everybody's going to love Mortimer Mouse. And his wife said, that's a really sucky name. Let's go with something different. And they ended up with Mickey Mouse. The mouse, as Walt came to call him, would conquer the world. In Europe, Mickey becomes as popular as Charlie Chaplin. Churchill, Mussolini, and Hitler have one thing in common. They all watch Mickey Mouse cartoons. And Walt goes to Europe in 1935. He carries around this big three-foot stuffed Mickey Mouse with him. He goes to London. Everybody goes, that's Walt Disney holding that big Mickey Mouse. So not only does Mickey become a hero, but Walt, just in his kind of gift for marketing and self-promotion, gets everybody to know who he is and, and that he's the papa of Mickey Mouse. Hello, Mickey. Hello to Mr. Aylesworth, Mickey. Hello, Mr. Aylesworth. How are you? Walt has another brainstorm. If five-minute cartoons can have such impact, what could he accomplish with an animated feature? It was a daring idea, and many called it crazy. Nobody really made an animated feature. And in fact, there was some kind of conjecture about whether you could sit and watch animation for that long. Would your head explode? Would it be something that was, you know, really annoying? Would you get a headache? Walt chooses the classic fairy tale, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. In the middle of the Great Depression, he spends millions to bring his vision to the screen. The project became known as Disney's Folly. On December 21st, 1937, Walt watched with dread as the film premiered at the Carthay Circle Theater in Los Angeles. Would his gamble pay off? Would his movie and his fledgling company go under? They're just sitting there with flop sweat going, I hope it works. And by the time they got to the end of the movie and Snow White had died and was in her glass coffin and the dwarfs were weeping at her feet, the audience started sniffing and crying and they thought, oh my God. They're sniffing and reacting and crying emotionally to drawings on the screen. 
No one had ever seen anything like it. By focusing on character and story, Disney showed that audiences could connect with animated characters as much as human ones. Snow White becomes one of the biggest money makers of all time. Walt finds himself on the cover of Time magazine, and the Motion Picture Academy presents him with eight Oscars, one full size, and seven miniatures. Basking in the glow of his success, Walt bets the house on a series of animated features, only to find his dreams shattered by a world in chaos. Walt had spent $3 million building a new studio in Burbank and spent all of his money on Pinocchio, Bambi, Dumbo, Fantasia, and they were $4 million in debt. World War II happened and a huge labor strike happened that walked all the animators off of his lot. So he lost everything. After the war, Walt looks to the future and new technologies to rebuild his company. Television uh, can be competition, yes. In other words, it's a, it's a medium that can keep people in their homes instead of uh, get them out. But uh, again, if you have the right kind of films, the people go out. Other studios see television as the enemy, come to steal their audience. But Walt sees fresh opportunities. Television destroyed lots of movie careers. People didn't know how to segue from one to the other. But Walt Disney understood that this opens up new possibilities. It didn't destroy the old ones, it added to them. And he was able to make that transition. In an era when science fiction portrayed invading aliens bent on destruction, Disney's TV shows present a wondrous vision of the future. Disney tapped into this belief, especially after World War II, with the development of rockets and the space age, that the future is really gonna be different. We're gonna be able to do different things. Years before JFK says, let's go to the moon, Walt says, let's go to the moon and Mars too. Disney's TV productions generated the money and publicity Walt needed to pursue his greatest ambition. He takes all the tools of filmmaking, lighting, actors, costumes, music, and sound, and uses them off the screen. Just as Snow White had wowed audiences with its dramatic story and memorable characters, Disneyland takes visitors on an emotional journey. So you go down and see the castle at the end of Main Street and then you're given this beautiful choice of places to go. Well, you don't just walk into Frontierland, you cross dissolve into Frontierland. So you cross a bridge and there's water and then there's a fort and then you go into the fort and you start to hear sounds of the Old West. And there's a shooting gallery and a place where you can buy a coonskin hat. And so suddenly through this cross dissolve from Main Street, you're in the Old West. These were narratives. They were complete stories. Nobody did that. That was really fresh and that was a way to experience it in a way that emotionally connected with the audience. So it wasn't just a theme park ride or a roller coaster. It was, it was a gut-level reaction to the personalities and narrative that existed in these parks. Uh, and that was what was so special about Walt Disney. He was a storyteller. He was also a brilliant and pioneering businessman. The corporate branding and cross-promotion that dominate entertainment in the 21st century, it all comes from Walt Disney. Mickey Mouse was a, a movie character, an animated movie character. And then on television, there's the Mickey Mouse Club. And then the Mouseketeers can take you to Disneyland, where you can see all the other Disney characters come to life. And so there's a nice circle here, and you can enter the circle anywhere. So if you first come in at television, then you're guided to Disneyland. You Maybe you'll go watch the movies, or if you first come in at Disneyland, you'll go watch the movies and the TV shows. Time is the friend of Walt Disney. Mickey Mouse just turned 90, 
and he looks as young as ever, even as each new generation experiences his charms. He really wanted his characters to live and have personalities and walk uh, and live and breathe and be believable. Even though they were made out of paint and pencils, they had to be believable. And that's why you want to own one. That's why you want to take Winnie the Pooh home and put it on your bed, is because you believe Winnie the Pooh exists. And maybe he does. And that's the real magic of Walt Disney.